For those of you watching this now, I would like to say this before you hear my story. If your parent or guardian never stressed the lesson of tell a trusted adult when you are in an uncomfortable situation, I am urging you to take this lesson seriously because I wish it was drilled into my head more. Because if it was, I know this experience would not have happened the way it did. The reason I am sharing this experience with you is because I am still seeking therapy for it to this day and probably for many more years to come. My therapist wanted me to finally go into detail of what happened that night, so I wrote this for them. But for the sake of privacy, I will be changing the names of those involved. Thank you. Now, let's begin with how it all began. This happened when I was 13 years old. My three best friends and I, who let's call Ella, Raven, and Jess, were having a sleepover at Ella's house since we wanted to watch the new movie in the franchise we were all obsessed over. Ella's house was the best choice since it was in between all of our houses and we would have the entire house to ourselves for most of the night. We planned out the entire night, as a young group of friends would do, but at the last minute decided to take a trip down to the Safeway that was about five or six miles walk from the house. Now, keep in mind that all four of us at the time were seasoned soccer players, so we could all run quite fast for a long duration of time. However, I was getting off of a pretty serious injury, so I couldn't run as fast or as long as I normally could, and I was a very conditioned runner at that time. Anyway, we arrived at the store around 4.30 p.m., I believe, and during that time of year and where we lived, the sun was still up, but it was going to disappear behind the mountain in about an hour or so. We didn't want to stay any longer than 15 or 20 minutes, since the walk back to her house would take more time since we would be walking uphill and carrying our grocery bags. We also didn't want to be left to walk home in the dark, since mountain lions and bears were common in her area. And if you know anything about living in an area like that, it was common knowledge to get inside before sunset. We finished our shopping and totaled about five or six bags to carry between the four of us. As we were about to leave the store, we heard Ella's name being called by one of the workers. Ella turned around and it turned out to be someone she knew. They chatted for a bit, but we couldn't really understand what they were saying to each other since they were talking in Spanish. Raven nudged Ella and said that we should go soon. So Ella said goodbye to her friend and we began to walk out of the store. I looked up and I estimated we had about 10 to 15 minutes of light left, so I said we should hurry. We began walking back home and as we were leaving, a ragged looking man approached us, asking for spare change or money. I was immediately hit with the smell of sweat, urine, feces, you name it, this man had it. I felt sympathetic for the man, since my family taught me to always be sympathetic to those less fortunate than us, even though we could have been labeled as lower class at that time since money was tight for us. I should also mention that since money was tight, my friends said that they would pay for my share since they had enough on them. Therefore, when the man asked us for cash, I said, Sorry, sir. I'm afraid we don't have any spare change on us. I was so naive, it made me sick. As to why I feel this way is because of what I now realize. We were told we lived in a safe area with low crime or theft, were all 13-year-old girls still carrying our spending money and had no idea how to handle the situation. The man began to step closer to us and outstretched one of his hands, which was covered in soiled bandages and covered in dirt. However, Ella is easily angered and is not afraid to fight people. So she immediately stepped forward and said a strong and affirmative, back off. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see my two other friends, Raven and Jess, became rigid with fear when Ella said this. The man began to get angry with us and said, well, it's probably because you spent all of your money on useless shit like junk food and treats. You ever think about those of us who can't afford those types of things, huh? No, and you know why? Because you're all spoiled shits. His voice was thick and raspy, but sounded weak, and his speech was slurred, and his posture was extremely laxed. His vibe was completely off-putting. He sent chills down my spine and made me nauseous. 
Just then, Jess nudged me in my back and looked at me and mouthed the words, Do something. And I am the type of person who doesn't get angry unless provoked, and I never let people scare those I care about. I reluctantly stepped forward and told the man to back off or there was going to be a problem. He looked at me dead in the eyes, and I will never forget what he did. He breathed in deeply, long and slow. His eyes rolled in the back of his head, and without saying a word or opening his eyes, turned around and walked around to, what I can assume, the back of the Safeway. The strangest part of all of this were the other people entering the Safeway. None of them seemed to notice the man at all, not a single one. One person in particular, the man was about to run into them, yet they hadn't made any form of notice of his presence. The four of us were all still in shock, but I spoke up and said, we need to go now. I regret my decision that day more than anything in my life. We should have gone back into the store and gotten Ella's friend's help, but instead we isolated ourselves and went straight to the only place where we would be alone. My friends and I then began running, and I mean running, back to Ella's house. I was at the back of the group due to my injury, and I swear on my life that I could hear footsteps behind me in the scrub oak we were running alongside. I wanted to look back, but I just kept on running. My conscience made me feel like I was running from pure evil. The sun had gone down at this point, and Ella was the only one who knew the way back but it was so dark that none of us could see where we were. Not that there was anything to see except for woods and the occasional weathered street sign. We stopped running after what seemed like 20 minutes and we were all exhausted. I knew the others were scared and acting frantically in their flight response. First to speak up and said, Ella, do you recognize anything around us? She sounded like she was on the verge of tears when she said, no. I'm so sorry, guys. I have no idea how to get home. Jess started to cry softly, and Raven went silent and sat down in the dirt. Something in the pit of my stomach urged me to speak up and tell my friends that I thought I heard those man's footsteps behind me as we were running. But I ignored it. They were all freaking out as it was, and I didn't want to escalate the situation any further. I knew basic survival skills for different occasions, so I took inventory of our surroundings. The moon was rising to my left, which meant the mountains were to the right. I looked on the mountain and found the lights of the radio towers glowing at the top of one of the higher peaks. Knowing this, I knew that Ella's house had to be about 4 or 5 o'clock. I shared this with my friends and started to lead them in that direction. I thought I saw a wave of relief on their faces, but I wasn't sure at that time. Just as we began walking in that direction, we all heard what sounded like a dying animal wailing in the scrub oak behind us. Branches cracking, dry grass shifting, and some small critters scurrying for cover. The smell of death, and what I can only explain as alcohol, filled the air. We all froze. I motioned them to start moving to the other side of the path and hide in the shadows. Luckily, we were on a paved path, so we were able to move quietly, and we were all wearing dark clothing that made no sound when we moved. Raven said we needed to get downwind in case it was a predator, but in my gut, I recognized that smell. The moments after that were silent. We heard nothing. The smell went away, and all of us were so quiet it was like we never existed. I was about to motion to the girls that we should start moving, but Jess grabbed my arm. She said nothing, but the look on her face told me. We weren't alone. She motioned with her eyes to look to my left, over my shoulder. I wanted to vomit. There was a dead deer being dragged along the road. I could see in the moonlight its blood was painting the pavement in a dark, thick color. I couldn't see what was dragging the deer but I could now hear faint, raspy breathing in synchronistic waves the deer was being pulled in. I slowly turned my head back to my friends, who were all on my right side. Raven's hand was being held tightly over her mouth, her eyes closed and curled up in a ball, trying not to make any noise from her faint whimpering. 
Ella had a cold expression that made me realize she was disassociating and could no longer take in anything that was happening around us. Knowing this, I grabbed them all by their hands, looked them in the eyes with reassuring glances, and told them as quietly as I could, we are going to be okay. Don't worry. We know how to get home now, and it's already killed, so as long as we don't go near its prey, it will leave us alone. We just need to move as quietly and swiftly as possible. They began to come back to reality and nod their heads in approval. I lied in some of my statements, trying to convince myself that they were true. I continued, You three will go ahead of me. Raven, you need to take the lead with Ella and keep her grounded. Raven was the type who needed something to distract herself, but also to keep Ella in check since she was the best at keeping people calm and grounded. She had enough experience with Ella and I since we both have mental illnesses that require grounding sometimes. She will be able to recognize where we are sooner or later. And when that happens, you need to relay that information to me through Jess. Jess, you go ahead of me and make sure that we stay as close together as possible. With that, we began to move as quietly as we could, yet still holding our bags since we hadn't realized we were still holding them. After about six minutes of pure fear, walking in the darkness at the back of the group, Jess relayed to me that Ella knew where we were and that she thought we would be home in about five minutes of walking. Just then, as Jess was picking up her pace to keep in the middle, I heard it again. I could hear the deep and long breaths that sounded exactly like those of the man at the store behind me. I am aware that paranoia can do unimaginable things, but this was no paranoia. I picked up my pace to where we were all together, knowing that we were more powerful together. We finally reached Ella's neighborhood and sprinted to her house. There were other house lights on so we could finally see what was around us. My subconscious told me to look behind us to see if I could see what was behind me now that there was light. As I ran, I looked back behind me and my heart stopped. I saw the silhouette of a man in the scrub oak with their hands outstretched and head arched back. It looked like they were almost worshiping something or someone. I whipped my head back around and sprinted at full speed, gathering my friends in front of me, urging them to run faster, saying a simple, go. We reached Ella's front door, punched in the door key and slammed the door shut. We were all panting in her doorway, but they were completely unaware of what I saw. We gathered up in the basement, since it was the most guarded area of the house with an alarm on the basement door if it was opened. Ella pulled out the air mattresses her family kept in the closet, and we gathered enough blankets to cover every square inch of the room. Once we all began to feel safe again, they all thanked me for keeping them calm and getting them back here safely. I said nothing, finally processing what I saw and everything we experienced. They nervously asked if I was alright, and with tears in my eyes, I told them what I saw and heard. They all said that they believed me, but I don't think that they will ever truly understand what I felt and saw that night when I saw that man, and I am so thankful for that. But the story doesn't end here. Now, I am a very heavy sleeper. For context, my mother used to wake me up with banging pots outside my door, and even that failed to work sometimes, so I have no idea why this happened. For more context, since we were in the basement, the windows were built underground with enough space for someone to fit in the space in front of it. Now, I still don't know if it was a dream or not, but I woke up to the sound of more breathing that same night, and when I opened my eyes... In the reflection of the mirror in Ella's bathroom, I could see outside of her window. My eyes tried to focus on the silhouette of what I saw, but I didn't have my glasses on. But from what I could make out, there was a person with their palms pressed on the glass of the window, staring at us while we slept. I passed out from the collected fear of that night finally hitting me, and when I woke up, there was nothing there not even a handprint. I asked them if they woke up at all last night and they all said no. It is now years later 
and let it be known that I have not had a single dream since that night. But I still have night terrors of open windows filled with figures watching me sleep, the smell of death and alcohol, darkness surrounding me completely, and running in place with death closing in on me until I wake up in cold sweats, trembling until morning. I don't know if these nightmares will ever stop, but I am thankful that none of my friends experience the same horrors I do.